Hi everyone, good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Katie Lee and I'm a senior and co-president of WISTEM. It's my pleasure to be moderating this afternoon session. Before we begin, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the entire talk at any time using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Everyone in the webinar can see all questions, so you can also use this same tool to upvote, which is the thumbs up button, any quest existing questions that you find interesting and would like to be asked. However, please note that these questions will not be asked until the end of the talk in the last 15 minutes or so. I'm now going to pass it off to Mr. Bradley Stoll, upper school mathematics teacher, who will start us off with Dr. Sun's introduction. Thank you, Katie. Good afternoon. I have the honor of introducing our alum, alumna speaker today, Dr. Yi Sun. I first met Professor Sun back in 2002, his freshman year in AP Calculus BC. Most people remember Yi as this brilliant math student, and that he was. He accomplished several firsts at Harker. Yi was the first member of our US math, USA International Math Olympiad team where he won a silver medal, and he was also our first Intel finalist where he also brought home a second place. And this is when Harker's upper school was only in its eighth year. What I remember most about Yi was his vast breadth and depth of knowledge, as well as his humility. I spent a great deal of time with Yi practicing for and attending quiz bowl competitions as he captained our team to the championship game of the once renowned Bay Area Quiz Kids show for two consecutive years. Upon graduating from Harker, Dr. Sun received his AB and AM in mathematics from Harvard. He then did a master's of advanced study in math at Uni the University of Cambridge. And finally, he earned his PhD in math from MIT. Dr. Sun was a Simons Fellow and a RIT assistant in the Department of Mathematics at Columbia University. Dr. Sun is now an assistant professor at the University of Chicago in their statistics department, where he is researching probability and its applications to machine learning and high dimensional statistics. Please welcome Dr. Yi Sun. Uh, thanks to Katie and Mr. Noel for those wonderful introductions. Um, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, it's great to be back at uh, Harker. Uh, so let me just share my slides real quickly. So today I wanted to speak on a topic, um, uh, a topic in, in machine learning, which connects uh, both something very algebraic, namely a uh, subject in algebra called representation theory, and something very practical, uh, namely the practice of cryo-electron microscopy. So let me first tell you about the problem, and then I go into some examples of that problem. So the problem, imagine the following situation. So you have an unknown signal, theta star. And we can represent the signal by a d-dimensional vector of real numbers. And what you're allowed to do is to observe uh, noisy observations of random rotations of this signal theta star. That is to say, um, every time you take a sample, theta star is rotated in some way. Then you measure with some noise, and that leads to your noisy measurement. And Okay, the task you want to accomplish is to recover this unknown signal, theta star, from these noisy measurements. Okay, so this is a very general setup, but there's one key observation um, in the whole story, which is that our measurements don't distinguish the unknown signal from any rotation of it. So what that means is the only thing we can hope to recover is the signal up to rotation. Uh, another way to say this is the thing we hope to recover is the orbit of the unknown signal theta star under some set of rotations. Okay, so that was a bit abstract. So let me give you some examples of this situation. So the first example is something called multi-reference alignment. So in this figure, the gray, uh, the gray curves in all of the plots are the signal. And then the rotations are simply cyclic rotations of the x-axis. So as you can see in the left column, the gray plot has been shifted or cyclically rotated in three different ways. Now the red lines correspond to noisy versions of this uh, gray signal. And so the task is given these red measurements to recover the gray signal. Although of course that's only possible up to rotation. As you can see on the left side, um, one might suspect that 
these peaks in the red signal allow us to align these noisy measurements at these peaks and thereby somehow average them to recover the gray signal. On the other hand, when the noise level is very high on the right-hand side, it's not so clear which part of the red signal, uh, the red measurements corresponds to these peaks in the gray signal. So as you can see, at a high noise level, the problem becomes more difficult. Okay, so just to give another example, um, there's this, another toy task called image registration. So in this task, we have a portrait of a man um, and it is randomly rotated around its center. So as you can see in these images, each of these images, you can sort of make out a blurred out picture of a man's face, uh, but there's a high degree of noise. And again, the task is given these 20 images to recover the original uncorrupted image of the man's face. Okay, so both of these examples were rather made up. Um, so let me tell you now the real world uh, task that all of these examples are inspired by. So that task is something called cryoelectron microscopy, which is a practice that's, that has become very common in uh, biology in the last 10 to 20 years. So here's how it works. So you have, uh, you have a large protein, and in the end, you want to understand what its shape is. So the workflow that's been developed is the following. First, you put the protein in some medium. You fire an electron beam at it. So imagine that the electrons are coming from the top of the slide to the bottom of the slide. And then you see the projection of the, these uh, molecules under the electron beam. So what you'll get is an image which looks like the one at the bottom. Um, you can see it's quite noisy, but you can make out certain images here. Um, so what you'll do is you'll take many images of this form and you'll try to aggregate them to somehow and learn what the th 3D structure of the um, individual molecules is. And once you have the 3D structure, you can um, perform many downstream tasks on it. For example, try to understand which, what the molecular composition is or other biological tasks. So this pipeline has become extremely prevalent in uh, biology and chemistry. And about 10% of the new protein structures discovered in let's say the last five years were determined using this cryo-electron microscopy method. And further, uh, the, the developers of this method were actually awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Okay, so this is quite a pervasive technique in both biology and chemistry. Okay, so I wanna dive deeper into this step in the middle here, where we go from projected images to 3D reconstructions of the molecule. So how does it really work? Well, we have some molecule. Imagine it's something like this Mickey Mouse face here. And the molecule, uh, we're taking snapshots of it with electron beams. Um, and what we're going to observe is the projection of the molecule under the electron beam. So something like this heat map up top. And so to relate this to our prior framework, what's happening is the, um, the position of each part of the molecule, that's our unknown signal the random rotations are coming from random tumblings of the molecule in the medium as we're taking electron snapshots. And the observations, well, they are these projections plus whatever noise comes from the interaction of the electron source with the medium during just the physical measurement of the electron microscope. Okay, so our samples here are these images of projections of randomly rotated molecules. Okay, so just to be a bit more concrete with the task, we're gonna record many of these uh, projected molecule images. So here, um, I've given an example of these projections with a very low level of noise. So as you can see from each of these projections, you can kind of make out, for example, in, in this image here that you can see this Mickey Mouse face. Um, but it's obviously not possible from just a single production to recover the entire three-dimensional image. Instead, if we look at all of the views of this Mickey Mouse face together, then maybe we can see from this one, we can understand the front of the face. Whereas, uh, let's say for this one, we can understand the structure of the side of the face. And so the task here is to take all of these projections together and create 
this three-dimensional view of Mickey Mouse that represents the original shape of the molecule. Okay, so this is a rather idealized form of the problem when there's a very low level of noise. As you can see here, you can even make out the general shape of the molecule just by a few of these projections. Now, in practice, um, the situation is much more difficult. And the reason for that is that there's a much higher degree of noise. So a real sample of data might look like the grid of images to the left. So here, this is, I believe, a 10 by 10 grid of snapshots of the molecule displayed on the right. This is a certain large protein. And as you can see, um, there's, you can clearly make out that there is some type of molecule, but the level of noise is such that it's very hard to say anything beyond that. And what uh, biologists do in practice is they'll take around 100,000 of these noisy images, and then they'll actually be able to reconstruct a 3D uh, picture of the molecule, which looks like the image on the right. Okay, this was actually taken from just an arbitrary biology paper where they apply this technique. Okay, so this is the task that's motivating uh, this learning theory problem I'm gonna discuss for the rest of the talk. Okay, so let me set up the problem just a bit more formally. So we have some, a, some set of rotation matrices and our task is to estimate this unknown signal from N rotated noisy observations. Uh, namely, I call it observation Y sub I, obtained by taking a random rotation, G sub I, applying it to the uh, unknown signal, and adding some random noise, epsilon sub I. And these are all d-dimensional uh, things. So here, um, it's not so important, but technically speaking, I'm gonna draw the randomness from uh, some group of rotations, and I'm gonna take Gaussian noise uh, as my noise model. Okay, so just remember that I have noisy, ro randomly rotated observations. Okay, so let's dive a little bit deeper into where the difficulty in this problem comes in. So the first source of difficulty is that as the signal to noise ratio decreases, the signal obviously becomes harder to detect. Namely, um, if here, here's some images of real data and um, there's sort of an increasing level of noise. So the clean image kind of looks like this. As you can see, it's not so clear, but it's not so bad. But, but as I decrease the signal to noise ratio um, at maybe signal to noise two to the minus five, it becomes hard to tell that there is any signal at all. And certainly at signal to noise two to the minus eight, uh, to my human eye, it's not possible to tell. Okay, so it's, it's, it's fairly intuitive that at such a low signal to noise ratio, this orbit recovery problem is gonna be much more difficult. Okay, so let's dive into a little bit about why that's difficult. So the first reason is that, well, if we had, um, if we had just noisy samples, unknown signal, but without this rotation, then even at a high noise level, we could simply just average all of them together. Um, but in this problem, because the orientations of the samples differ by rotation, which we don't know, we can't directly do such an averaging behavior. Namely, if we wanted to average, we would want to sort of re-rotate all of our samples to somehow be aligned, and then we could average out the noise. Um, unfortunately, when the noise level is very high, it's not very clear that a signal exists as we saw from the previous slide. Uh, for example, in this blown up image, the uh, region highlighted in red actually contains the molecule. And of course, it's not, hard, it's not easy to see that from just knowledge of this image. In fact, it's possible to theoretically show that for high enough noise, even if you know what the molecule exactly looks like, it's not possible to find where in the image the molecule is just from the knowledge of the shape of the molecule alone. Okay, so what that means is that uh, the traditional method of sampling, of estimating an unknown signal in the presence of a high level of noise, namely just averaging all the samples, isn't gonna work here directly. Okay, so let me now tell you, tell you basically how we can approach this problem and try to overcome these difficulties. Okay, so the first method, which is called synchronization, 
is probably the most naive method. So what's synchronization? Well, I have a number of samples, which are noisy rotations of some unknown signal. So I can just try to reverse those rotations. Okay, so for every pair of samples, I'll try to estimate this unknown rotation, which takes one to the other. And then I'll use those estimates to align all of the samples. Namely, for every sample I sub i, I'll reverse the rotation and put all of the uh, all of my samples in some canonical orientation. Once I've done that, I can produce an estimate just by trying to average over all of those samples. Okay, so this approach works very well if I can actually align all of my samples. And that's possible in the low noise regime, but as we saw from the previous two slides, it's not actually uh, possible to estimate this unknown rotation when the noise level is high enough. Okay, so what that means is that synchronization actually works pretty well in practice when the problem setting is such that the noise is low, but it's not very good when the noise is high enough. Okay, so here's just a visual illustration of that in a very toy example. So here, my problem is to learn a two-dimensional point. And the true point is the point one comma zero in the real plane. Now, the unknown rotation I'm allowing is a rotation by 120 degrees in the plane. So as you can see, um, even though my true point is one comma zero, on the left-hand side, when I sample with lo low noise, I sample around the point one comma zero, the rotation by 120 degrees to this point in the second quadrant, or the rotation by 240 degrees, this point in the third quadrant. And as you can see on the left-hand uh, picture, if I have this smaller amount of noise, the, the sample points, namely the dots on the plane, clearly fall into three clusters. Um, this blob here, here, and here. So what that means is that if I sample a point from one of those clusters, I can, I can roughly guess which cluster it belongs to. And then I can sort of cancel out that rotation by moving all of these points to roughly the first cluster and average those to recover the signal. Uh, theta star equals one comma zero. On the other hand, if the level of noise is very high, I might get samples which look like the image on the right. So here, it's generated actually in the same way. I start with my unknown signal, one comma zero, so that's right here, and then it's it's uh, either stays at the signal or it's rotated to the same points at the second quadrant or the third quadrant. Just note the scales are very different. Now, the difference here is that I then add a very high level of Gaussian noise. And my samples now, the three clusters that appeared on the left have now merged into one very large cluster on the right. And so what that means is that when I take a sample, it's very hard for me to tell whether it comes originally from uh, the original unknown signal, one comma zero, or any specific rotation of it. Okay, so in, the, in terms of alignment, that means that it's, essentially impossible for me to align my samples and then apply the average. Okay, so this illustrates the difference between the low noise and high noise uh, versions of this problem. And in what follows, I'd like to discuss two approaches that work better for the high noise set. Okay, so the first approach is called the invariant features approach. And it's actually how I was drawn into working on this problem in the first place. Uh, so what's the idea behind this approach? Well, we have some unknown signal theta star, and it's a very common technique in machine learning to try to identify an unknown signal using what are called features. Now, a feature is just a function of something unknown. Okay, so it's very frequent that when you're trying to learn something unknown, you'll be able to measure certain functions of it, and then you want to estimate what the unknown value is from those functions. And the idea here is that if we have many different features, let's say f sub one, oops, f sub one, f sub two, f sub k, then if we know the value of all of them, then maybe we can estimate the unknown signal. Now, what's special here is that we only measure random rotations of the unknown signal. So what that means is that uh, the features that we estimate, well, they shouldn't depend on what rotation was applied to the unknown signal. And what that means is that we'd like to consider only features which are invariant 
under rotations. Namely, those features such that if I took a signal, theta, and I rotate it by some rotation, g, then the value of the feature is actually the same. Okay, so that's called an invariant feature. Um, so our, our approach will be to try to construct a bunch of invariant features and try to understand how many invariant features are necessary to have to learn any specific unknown signal. Okay, so we're gonna take maybe a somewhat naive approach to this, which we'll see will actually uh, work. And that approach, the naive approach will be, we're only gonna consider features which are polynomials in the coordinates of the unknown vector. Okay, so we're just gonna consider polynomials whose values don't depend on rotations of its, their inputs. So to give an example, suppose that my, uh, my input is d-dimensional and my rotations are simply all orthogonal rotations in d-dimensions. Um, so in that case, if I take the polynomial, which is simply the sum of the squares of my coordinates of my d-dimensional vector, namely the length of my d-dimensional vector, then that polynomial is going to be invariant because the, uh, the length of a vector is not affected by rotations. Right? So rotations don't change lengths of vectors. So in this case, this uh, length, the squared length of my vector in Rd would be an invariant feature of my unknown signal. Um, just as another example, suppose that the uh, random rotations I'm allowed to apply are simply by randomly permuting the coordinates of my input. Um, in this case, the, uh, the property that polynomials are invariant under these permutations of coordinates simply says that the polynomials are symmetric. Okay, so let's now talk about what invariant features might mean in this setting. Well, the point is that if I take these specific features, uh, the power sums of the, these specific features called power sum polynomials, namely the sum of the kth powers of the coordinates of my unknown signal theta, then these actually are going to uniquely characterize the unknown signal up to permutation. Okay, so what this says is that if I want to learn an unknown signal up to just its permutation of coordinates, all I have to know is the d values uh, p1 of theta, p2 of theta, through pd of theta, namely the sum of the kth powers of the coordinates of theta for k between one and d. Okay, um, and algebraically, this is related to the fact that any symmetric polynomial in the coordinates of theta can be expressed in terms of these power sum polynomials. So what we're gonna do is going to be an analog of this idea for any group of rotations. Okay, so, so this part, uh, so, so to, to do this, we're going to have to use a somewhat deeper algebraic fact. Um, so the fact simply states that if we want to, uh, if we want to characterize all, feature, um, all invariant polynomial features under some set of rotations, G, then all we have to do is to find the values of a finite list of polynomials. Um, so P sub one through P sub D minus the dimension of my allowed rotations. And if we know this finite list of values, then we're gonna be able to uh, recover the values of the unknown signal theta. Okay, so the idea here is that it, as long as we use these, this finite list of invariant features, then we'll be able to recover the unknown signal. And so this idea can be made effective, and it was shown by a paper in 2017 that so if our noise level is very high, then if we can write down this list of invariant polynomials um, and their, their maximum degree is L, then we can actually recover the unknown signal up to a finite list of options um, with a specific number of samples. Namely, the number of samples we need is roughly the uh, noise level to the 2L. Um, and in fact, this is the best that we can do. 
Okay, so the way this works is simply that we only have to recover the value of these invariant features. And uh, because we know that these invariant features are simply polynomials in the coordinates of the unknown signal, that allows us to later recover the number of samples that we need. Okay, so I know that this, this last algebraic part was a bit abstract, but I want to emphasize that this links a theoretical property of this learning problem with a purely algebraic property about some type of invariant polynomials. Okay, so it allows us to understand the difficulty of this learning problem in terms of some algebraic machinery. Um, unfortunately, this whole method has a big drawback. And that drawback is this. It's very effective for studying sort of the theory of learning and how hard is this learning problem. But it's actually very difficult to put this method of invariant features into practice. Uh, the reason is that, well, the process of estimating the unknown signal from the knowledge of the invariant features is not computationally efficient. Um, so there's a lot of numerical analysis problems and small errors in the values of the invariant features can lead to very large errors in the estimate for the unknown signal. Uh, so to, to, for the rest of the talk, I wanna discuss an alternate method, which is more computationally effective and in fact is what's used in practice. And then I'll show you that there's some link actually to the algebraic structure underlying these invariant features. Okay, so the method that's actually much more popular and is what um, you know, chemists and biologists use before any of the theoretical people got into this area is called maximum likelihood. Okay, so let me give you sort of our, a cartoon view of what maximum likelihood is. So suppose you have your unknown, your, your, your samples Y sub I that are noisy samples from your randomly rotated unknown signal. Um, maximum likelihood says to consider a function which is called the log likelihood. And roughly speaking, it's the probability of observing these samples uh, in terms supposing that the signal were theta. So you sort of ask, for some input to my log likelihood theta, what would be the probability that I actually saw the samples I saw in practice? And we can write down that probability as this very large function, um, uh, this very large sum. So it doesn't really matter for the purpose of this talk what is its function, but just know that it can be written down explicitly. Um, and what max maximum likelihood estimation, or MLE, says to do is to find an estimate theta hat, which maximizes this log likelihood, hence maximum likelihood estimation. And the idea is that, well, I saw some samples and I'm just gonna pick a guess for what the unknown signal is so that those samples were actually the most likely to be seen out of all conceivable choices for the unknown signal. Okay, so, the takeaway here is that we have this log likelihood function. It's the probability of observing the samples given a signal. And MLE says to find the maximal sig signal, find the signal that maximizes that log likelihood. Okay, so, well, how do we actually make that effective in practice? So what we have to do is we take this log likelihood function and find a maximum. So that requires optimization, optimizing this log likelihood function. Now, what I've plotted here is two contour plots of this log likelihood function. And uh, these contour plots are also called the likelihood landscape. Okay, so on the left-hand side, I have small noise. And as you can see, um, there's sort of a maximum near the points one comma zero and rotations of it. Um, so you can sort of see that the likelihood is peaked near the true um, unknown signal values. And it obviously decreases away from them. Uh, and the decreases here are somewhat sharp. On the right-hand side, I've plotted the lock likelihood landscape at large noise. And you can see there are still sort of extrema of the likelihood at the true signal values, but it's much more flat. And so what this shows is that, you know, optimizing the left-hand function should be a little easier than optimizing the, uh, the function plotted on the right. And it shows that basically the optimization properties of the maximum likelihood estimator 
are going to depend on the properties of this likelihood landscape. Okay, and there's actually two properties that I want to uh, really emphasize. The first is something called the Fisher information. Um, so that's going to be sort of what the likelihood landscape looks like locally around the true value of the unknown signal. So if you look on the left, uh, near this point, the, uh, the contours are roughly circular. Um, so that means that basically the local geometry of the likelihood landscape is circularly symmetric around the true optimal. On the right-hand side in the high noise regime, if you look near the true, um, the, the true optimum, the, the contours are somewhat oblong. Namely, there's some asymmetry between the radial and angular direction in the curvature of this landscape. And so that's gonna affect the local optimization properties when we actually try to compute the MLE near the true, true unknown signal. Uh, secondly, we also care about the global optimization landscape. Namely, how if we apply some optimization algorithm to try to maximize the log likelihood, well, we're certainly going to end up at a local maximum. But we don't know whether that local maximum is actually going to be one of the um, true unknown signals, or maybe there could be some, um, it, maybe it just could be some other random point. Okay, so we want to ask, like, is this, um, is maximizing the uh, log likelihood actually gonna lead us to this unknown signal? Okay, so we'll call a maximizer that doesn't lead us to an unknown, the unknown signal a spurious maximum. Okay, so for this likelihood landscape, what we care about is these two properties, the Fisher information, which is locally around the unknown signal and the global landscape, which is just about the landscape as a whole. Okay, so First of all, let's talk about what this looks like in the low noise regime. So that corresponds to the plot on the left in the previous slide. So in this case, um, we can actually show um, that locally around the unknown signal, the Fisher information is almost always, is almost isotropic. Namely, it's pretty much symmetric in all directions. Okay, so there's really no direction that any optimization algorithm will be biased in when getting very close to this unknown signal. And the second thing that we were able to show is that as long as your sample size is large enough, then there's no spurious local maximum. So if you run the MLE in a very low noise setting, then you're basically guaranteed to get too close to the unknown signal. Okay, so this is the problem is pretty easy in the low noise regime. Um, you can just run maximum likelihood estimation and you're pretty much gonna recover the uh, local, uh, the, the unknown signal pretty accurately. So let's now move on to this more difficult case of high noise. So in this case, um, the, we were able to show that the Fisher information, namely the local behavior of the curvature of the likelihood landscape near the unknown signal is anisotropic, namely that it's not symmetric in all directions. And we're also able to produce a decomposition of the dimension of the of this space, so that um, the curvature in these in different directions has vastly different orders. Okay, and those orders are controlled by the uh, noise level. Okay, so here we're able to show that this the number of directions of each order is related to some algebraic property of this um, of the invariant polynomials under rotations that we discussed earlier in the talk. Okay, and it's related in some sort of technical algebraic way. So just to give an illustration, if we have this threefold rotations on the plane, um, as I mentioned earlier, near the true optimum, well, the, this likelihood landscape, it's much, uh, it's much more sharply peaked in the radial direction, and it's much flatter in the angular direction. Okay, and that's exactly what's predicted by a result. Um, secondly, if we consider the example of permutations on, um, on, D, on a d-dimensional vector, then it turns out that the Fisher, that the, through the algebraic structure, we can show that the Fisher information namely the curvature near the true optimum 
has eigenvalues of vastly different order, orders of magnitude, namely their directions in which the Fisher information has curvature with very different values. Okay, so I wanna move on just to mention one last result about the global landscape in the high noise regime, okay? So this is actually a much more complicated issue and uh, generally it's quite hard to study. Um, and, and methods, MLE methods in practice actually sort of don't handle this in a very good way, okay? So what we're able to show is that the global landscape is also determined roughly by the algebraic properties of these invariant features I mentioned earlier. So let me tell you just as a cartoon how that goes. So if we take a vector T sub L of sort of degree L invariant polynomials, then we can consider the following optimization problem. Let's ask that we choose our estimate of the signal theta so that the degree L invariant polynomials are very close uh, evaluated at theta are very close to the degree L invariant polynomials evaluated at our unknown signal theta star. Um, and let's call that optimization problem opt sub L. So our philosophy is that if in the high noise regime, maximizing the log likelihood, namely finding the MLE, that's gonna be um, a very close problem to successfully successively uh, matching the G invariant moments in degree one, two, and so on. So if we can sort of get the values of all degree one G invariant features to match, and then all degree two G invariant features to match, and so on, then the resulting theta we found will be a solution to the MLE. And there's some precise sense in which this holds. And what we're able to show is that if these optimization problems um, themselves are globally benign, namely every local maximum is a global maximum, then the likelihood landscape of the maximum likelihood uh, estimator is also globally benign for a large sample size. And we're able to uh, use this to show uh, that various toy problems are globally benign, but that there are many problems where the landscape actually is not globally benign and there are spurious local maximizers. Okay, and I wanna make a comment sort of in general, uh, we expect that almost every problem you can write down actually does have spurious local maximizers. And in particular, we believe that cryo-EM has spurious local maximizers. And so that means that any maximum likelihood algorithm in practice needs to somehow account for this fact. Okay, so I talked a lot about various uh, theoretical approaches to this learning under symmetry problem. Um, and now I want to end the talk with just a brief story about, you know, what does this mean for maybe some biologists who actually want to run cryo-EM to recover some molecular structures? And the takeaway is the following. So in practice, how do people actually do cryo-EM? Well, they'll compute the maximum likelihood um, estimator using an optimization algorithm that's called the EM algorithm. I've written down um, just the technical details here, but th th that's not quite so important. Namely, what EM does is it basically makes successive guesses for the unknown signal, and it iteratively refines them. So a more common name for it is called iterative refinement. And what it's equivalent to is an optimization algorithm called gradient descent on the likelihood landscape. So gradient descent is quite simple. You you look at where you are on the likelihood landscape, and at every step, you just try to go um, up as much as possible. And you go, up, you take a step of size sigma squared. Okay, so, so this size sigma squared, um, in the low noise regime, it actually matches the curvature of your uh, of the landscape near the unknown signal, and it can be shown that that's pretty much an optimal way to do optimization for the MLE. Uh, but in the high noise regime, we, sh um, we found that, remember, these, these likelihood landscapes have very oblong contours near the unknown signals. And so what that means is actually the step size sigma squared um, is suboptimal. It's not really the best way 
to do gradient descent. And so it, there's some philosophy that when you actually have an anisotropic uh, Fisher information, then you can use different optimization algorithms to get faster convergence. And so we're actually able to change either the step size of gradient descent um, in blue, or just use a slightly more complicated optimization algorithm in green to dramatically increase the convergence rate in some toy situations. So here in red is the default EM algorithm, and in blue and green are our small changes to try to improve convergence. Um, so what this suggests is that there may be a way to actually speed up practical optimization for cryo-EM um, in practice. Okay, so to sum up, um, it started from, the starting point of this talk was this practical uh, problem of cryo-electron microscopy, namely taking these very noisy images of randomly rotated molecules and recovering their three-dimensional structures. And I tried to show sort of how this can be extracted into a more abstract problem of learning under a symmetry group. Um, and that was all related in principle to this algebraic structure of the ring of invariant features. Okay, so th these results sort of show that despite being quite abstract, these properties of these invariant features actually are related to very concrete optimization properties of methods used for uh, cryo-EM in practice. And so in future work, we're hoping to actually adapt this into the, the real pipelines for cryo-EM. And that's gonna deal with, that's gonna rely on dealing with a lot more real world sort of complex image processing issues. All right, so thanks for listening and I'd love to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sun, for your very interesting presentation. Um, I know I definitely got a bit lost at times, but I think some people in the Q&A <laughs> did understand um, and so have some questions for you. So the first one is, um, do you think cryo Electromicroscopy, I can't say that word, will replace crystallography? Uh, that's a great question. I guess I, I'm not an expert on these experimental issues, but I, my understanding from talking to people who do cryo-EM is that that's one of the big advantages. So the, the alternative to cryo-EM is, as mentioned, um, crystallography, which requires you to take this very large molecule, let's say a protein, and crystallize it. And that's a very difficult ad hoc operation. So generally, you know, I have some friends who are graduate students in organic chemistry labs, and they literally would spend two or three years trying to crystallize a molecule so that you could apply X-ray crystallography. And cryo-EM is actually a lot more flexible about that. Um, I wanna mention Wendy one point, which is the reason it's more flexible is exactly that it's able to handle these random ro rotations of molecules. Whereas in crystallography, what does it mean that, let's say, a protein is in a crystal? It means that it's in a very regular shape, and therefore, when you're imaging it, you can assume much more about its orientation. Whereas in cryo-EM, you have these random rotations that now need to be handled sort of later on in the data processing pipeline. Definitely, so, I think. Okay, awesome. Um, I think our next question is about the invariance. So with regards to the use of invariant features, could researchers remove pixels that do not represent the protein in order to lower the amount of coordinates calculated? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I, I guess one issue with this, uh, this whole problem is that when the noise level is very high, it's actually quite difficult to even know where the protein is in your image. So let's suppose that you took an image that's, let's say a thousand by a thousand pixels. The molecule might only be in some 50 by 50 grid. And so there's a whole sort of pre-processing task is of even identifying the 50 by 50 like sub image where the, your, your relevant image is. Um, so there, there are um, sort of heuristics for doing this, but once you've localized your image to some small location, it's actually quite hard to tell which pixels are relevant. Okay, definitely, thank you. Um, and then, Along the same lines, why is the estimation of the invariant features similar to that of the log likelihood? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. And I definitely hid this in my talk because it's a, it's a bit more technical. Uh, roughly speaking, the answer is that 
Um, in the high noise regime, you, you should view the log likelihood as um, you, you can sort of take a series expansion of the log li likelihood in the inverse of your noise parameter. And what will happen is that you will see these invariant polynomials in diff as different coefficients of the series uh, of this series expansion of the log likelihood. So despite it not being very obvious that these two things should be related at all, um, actually it turns out that the algebraic structure of the invariant features is somewhat intrinsic to um, this log likelihood function. Uh, and, and that's actually why it shows up throughout this work, because it might seem at first that these invariant features are, are some artificial, very you know, technically involved, but not practical uh, feature of the problem. But it turns out because they show up as these series coefficients in the log likelihood, I think you're sort of forced to confront them. I see. Um, and then one more question from the same person, actually. The methods described here deal with the protein rotating in 2D space. How would you deal with rotation in 3D space? Is that even a problem? Uh, that, that's a good question. Actually, um, so this is another point that I, I sort of tried to, tried to elide in the talk. Um, so the rotations actually are in 3D space, but of course your samples are in 2D space. So there's, and you know, how is that related? Well, there's this electron beam and we take these observations, which are 2D projections of 3D images, right? So, so of course, if you rotate a 3D, a three-dimensional molecule and you take a snapshot, well, you're only getting some of that information uh, from that two-dimensional projection. Okay, so, so, so here we, um, in this framework, I sort of did not present anything about the projection, but actually everything has some minor modification to handle these, uh, these projections. Definitely. Um, and then I'm I so think sorry, we... Kate, let me interrupt just for a moment. Dr. Dr. Sun, would you um, unshare your screen now so that we can see you a little bit better? Oh, yes. Uh, Thank you so much. Great. Okay, um, sorry, I was just gonna say, last question in the Q&A box, I think. Um, this person said uh, that you mentioned two methods in your presentation and you mentioned that the second one is more effective computationally. So what are some of the advantages of the first method you described? That, that's a great question. So, so I guess the, the, the two methods were essentially using invariant features and using maximum likelihood. And at, as the question mentions, maximum likelihood is both what's used in practice and what is uh, computationally effective. Um, so the, the reason to study the invariant features method, despite it being sort of impractical, is that it's much more theoretically easy to analyze. Um, so namely, one can say, if you want to learn the unknown signal up to some error, um, in principle, what's the number of samples you would need? And, and so, so that's valuable because it can provide a way to say, well, if you want to learn the unknown signal up to some error, you need at least this many uh, samples. And so that sort of result would apply also to more practical methods like maximum likelihood. And it provides sort of theoretical constraints on what, what you can even aim for. Uh, na namely, if you're sampling just too few samples to even theoretically learn what the unknown signal is, then certainly you wouldn't be able to learn the unknown signal in a computationally effective way. Uh, so I guess that's one reason to study the invariant features method. Uh, the second reason is that it sort of, because of this connection between the log likelihood and invariant features, um, studying one sort of helps you understand the other. And actually the goal of my involvement in this area was to try to take, uh, take the field from focusing, there's sort of two groups in the field. One is like biologists who like, they write code and they're really trying to like get pictures of molecules. And the other is maybe theoretical learning people. And so they more care about I mean, more theoretical questions of here's an abstract learning problem, like what are its properties, how many samples do we need, and so on. And they're actually not very concerned with like who are the people actually using this, this learning technique. And so I, I got involved in this because I had a lot of background in these invariant features um, just from my PhD, but I was sort of interested in taking, trying to relate that to what I'd heard about cryo So, you know, you read about in, in many sources about cryo that it's a huge scientific breakthrough. And to me, it was very surprising that this algebraic structure actually underlay it and that it can be connected in this way. Um, so, 
Well, I definitely agree that some of these theoretical approaches can seem sort of abstract and not that related to other things. I think this is one of the rare cases where there is some connection that you can leverage. Okay, thank you so much um, for you know sharing more about your research and your work. Um, I think that's all that we have, sorry, all questions that we have about your work, but we did want to ask about um, you as a Harker alumnus. Um, and so um, about your journey from a Harker student to where you are right now, um, like, can you talk a little bit about that and any maybe challenges, obstacles, I, I don't know, anything that happened along the way? Uh, yeah, um, let me see. So I, I guess, so, so right now I, uh, I just started at the statistics department at UChicago. And I guess coming out of Harker, I'd always been really interested. I was sort of interested in a lot of things, but primarily I was really interested in math. And so it's actually been a bit of a journey for me to go from studying when I went to college, I was studying pretty much only theoretical math. And then I went to, I did a master's and I did a PhD all in like very theoretical areas of math. So my PhD was actually in a branch in a branch of math called representation theory. So it's a branch of algebra that's the study of, of symmetries. So you, that's quite broad. So my, my specific PhD was about sort of some type of symmetries which occur in some string theories. And so I guess in the last maybe five to 10 years, one thing that's happened is I've gotten much more interested in applied such subjects. So I shifted away almost entirely from that area and I started working more in probability and in machine learning. So that's been a big process of learning a new area, trying to see how things I've done before can transfer over and slowly working in this new space. Uh, Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's actually everything that we have for today. Um, so a big thank you once again um, for your wonderful keynote presentation. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for attending our alumni keynote. Um, friendly reminder that we have another keynote speaker and panel discussion later this afternoon. Um, and be sure to visit the webpage to stay up to date with the schedule. Um, so that concludes our webinar.